Thanks, Brendan. Pastor Chris was just saying that, um, yeah, it's not always easy as a parent, but um, Brendan's got Parker to deal with, so there's a lot, there's a lot to go on there. <laughs> no, Parker's awesome. Um, in fact, he ran up to me just tonight um, as soon as he saw me and gave me a big um, Uncle Peter hug, I guess, and asked if I brought the lolly box with me. <laughs> that was a really good, honest testimony. Um, you do wonder when you're going through journeys, um, whether it's sort of solo or, or together as a team or a family, um, what's the big reason behind it. But uh, when a victory comes from it, it's especially collective victory, it's pretty cool. If you've got your Bibles, if you're at home or at the hall, let's go to the Old Testament and we'll go to Esther chapter 4. I wanted to talk about belief. Uh, the story of Esther, it's set in a city called Shushan, um, Persian city. There's a few key characters in this story. You've got a king and a queen and a villain. Um, you've got Esther herself, uh, which the story is uh, surrounded by Esther, and then her seemingly uncle, Mordecai. Um, the king, at the time, he hosts a banquet or a, or a couple of banquets, like parties, but these are like parties on steroids that go for about half a year. And he's drunk as a skunk one day, and he calls for the queen, Vashti, um, and he wants the queen to come in and, and almost show off her beauty to everyone, keeping in mind he's drunk. And um, Vashti declines the offer. Um, I'm not sure what went through her head, but presumably she thought the king was a, a um, superficial sexist pig to do something like that, I don't know. But she declined the offer. And um, uh, Queen Vashti became Queen Vanishy um, and just left. She, she leaves the story, basically. And, um, and then um, Mordecai, well, sorry, there's a, um, I guess if you're sort of regarding the king as having a bit of a superficial layer about him, he, didn't, he needs a new queen. He needs someone else to come in. And um, to decide that, he hosts a beauty pageant. And um, in, in comes Esther, and she's a beautiful young woman, um, and Esther becomes queen. Um, amongst all this, um, amongst all this, there's this guy in the background named Haman, and Haman, um, uh, Haman, Haman, Haman was basically the king's right-hand man, and um, Haman um, had a few issues that he needed to deal with. Um, when the king went forward, um, and invited Vashti to come in, and Vashti declined. I, th I presume the king felt embarrassed because the next minute a decree went out to the nation. He looked after over 127 provinces, and a decree went out, and, a, and it said that the, the men at home are the bosses, and, and there's no arguing this, basically. Um, so it was a very sort of clear um, staple that went out. Um, Haman helped with that. Mordecai, Esther's uncle is floating around and he's sort of hanging around the gates of um, the women's area of the, of the palace because his niece now had become queen and he wanted to hang around there and just check in and see how Esther was every now and again. Uh, every now and, again. and um, as he's pacing up and down one day, um, he hears two royal guards talking about plotting to kill the king and he hears that. So he tells his niece, he tells um, Esther who's now queen, Esther tells the king, and the two royal guards have their last day. Um, and then amongst all this, um, there's a group of, of Jewish people living in the area, and you get the impression they're not too welcome there. And long story short, Haman helps set up this uh, other decree that um, they're going to remove the Jews uh, from the area and when I say remove, I mean remove permanently. And, um, and a plan is made for this. 11 months down the track, it's going to happen. Amongst all this, Haman, who seems to be this very insecure, I mean, he's, he's obviously very confident and very skilled man to be in the position that he is, but he's obviously got a layer of insecurity because at one moment in this story, um, everyone's told to bow to this man. Yet there's one man in the crowd that decides he's not going to bow, and that's Mordecai because this man, is, is, he's got a depth of principle about him. But when Haman sees that, um, he takes it as an insult and has it in for Mordecai. 
So the, there is a scene set at this stage of this young Jewish woman, and by the way, she hasn't announced or, or, or pronounced that she's Jewish to the crowd. Um, and, and Mordecai uh, neither declared that um, he was of the same background. But then Haman finds out that he is. And so he, he, he not only doesn't tolerate, Haman doesn't tolerate Mordecai, now he detests him and, and he sets up gallows for him. So where we're capturing this story, and it's just one verse, and I wonder if it's the very pinnacle, the very centre point to this story, is that you've got two people here that have... In comes this young woman, and she's declared queen from the, from the outskirts, from the corridors of nowhere, and now she's got this royal um, peace that's been put on her. And in this story, he's Esther and her uncle talking, and... He goes and checks with her at the front gates. And in this very moment that we capture here is just one verse, but it is possibly the the turnaround for the whole story. One verse in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, says here, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time... So this is Mordecai um, talking to his niece, Queen Esther. Then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise from... Uh, arise to the Jews from another place but you and your father's house shall be destroyed and who knows whether you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this at this very moment Esther is looking down the barrel of losing her uncle she's looking down the barrel of losing her whole kindred all the Jewish people in the land that might have been further down the track but her uncle has got days or hours ahead of him and, and, and something in Mordecai believes, we're talking about belief, something in Mordecai believes that the people will be delivered. He just doesn't know how, he doesn't know when, he doesn't know who. He doesn't know the details, but there's something inside of him. And he passes on this belief to his niece, presumably niece, and installs this seed in her mind that there is a way out of this. And he doesn't have all the answers. He doesn't have a A to Z all clued up. All he knows is all he believes. And what he believes is that there shall be a deliverance. And this seed is planted in this woman's head. And you, you've got to keep in mind of this story. She is a young woman. She's come from who knows where, but she has not been trained in the royal procedures or anything like that. She's just a young girl now with a crown on her head married to the king just all by chance and she could have there's two angles or two avenues that this girl could have taken she or this young woman one is she could have taken the safe road and she would have had to get used to the fact that she was going to lose her uncle and that later down the track she'd lose a whole group of people but her life would be safe and her life would be secure and she would know her ending Um, so sad as many aspects of that might have been she could predict her own ending. Or there's the fact that she can not play it safe. She can take a risk and take a chance and, and in this case, literally put her life on the line. And so she is on this sort of this balance beam of a decision that um, became her moment. If she played it safe, she would not have a moment. But she took a risk and she took the instilled belief that she is part of something bigger than her, that she is part of something that's a, that's a greater purpose than what she ever could have imagined, and that she, she, she might not regard herself as anything special. I dare say she was a humble young woman, but amongst that, she had a, play to, a part to play. And in the end, the story goes on, and, and she saves, um, she walks into the king. See, the difference between Vashti and Esther is that Vashti was invited in to the king and she declined and and there goes Vashti but Esther was not invited into the king and yet she dares to walk in and pronounce that she is a Jew and that her uncle is a Jew and the whole situation gets turned around on its head dramatically complete opposite to what you would have imagined And, and, and amongst this Haman who's the villain who had been making the gallows for Mordecai, he 
um, Haman has to parade Mordecai around and Haman ends up losing his life. There's, um, there's little parts in our life, I guess, and I just wanted to tap into the thought of belief that we will come to, there's probably two angles, we will come to forks in the road in, in our own personal lives. Um, and that can be reactively or proactively. We can have a situation where that's it, it's come to me and I, I really need to deal with this and move forward. And do I play the safe, the safe way, or do I, do I go out on a limb and believe that the Lord has got a plan? Or um, proactively is that we know within ourselves that maybe there's a bit of room for improvement and we have the same, re the same reaction. Um, we may not always see the Lord through our circumstances. In fact, this whole book, God isn't even mentioned. But yet, if you look closely through the different points, um, through the different plot twists, just through the way this story goes, you can see that God is, is in and about every part of this story. And you may not wake up every day and um, think that, God is at the center point of your life. But if you look hard, like you look in this book here, in this story, you will find God in your own story. Let's go to Acts chapter 11, talking about belief. <clears throat> uh, ben Campbell recently talked uh, just here on a Sunday evening about the equations and, um, of salvation, basically, and um, different scriptures, Ephesians 2 and Romans 10 and Acts 2 and Acts 10, Acts 19, and, and how um, by faith you are saved, by grace you are saved, but receiving the Holy Spirit is also uh, incredibly important. Acts 10, is a, it's a pretty detailed uh, chapter, and it goes through, it's, it's quite thorough. Peter receives a vision, um, Cornelius, similar, and they end up meeting. And in verse 44 to 48 of Acts chapter 10 is the pinnacle of this story where, where they meet. And um, it, there's, there's a lot of depth in this story um, about how Peter learns that salvation is not just of a particular people or a particular race, but salvation is to everyone. He who has ears, let him hear. Anyone that has ears for the gospel, the good news for their lives to be changed, then, then they're welcome to the salvation. And that was Peter's greater lesson in depth. But in simplicity for a Wednesday night, simple suits me on a Wednesday night, I just wanted to look at something very, very simple in this. If you go to Acts chapter 10 is the greatest story, Acts chapter 11 is the condensed version. Let's just, for time's sake, choose a couple of verses from Acts 11. I have one word in this chapter that I've highlighted. Um, Acts 11 verse 2. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou, wentest, thou, thou went into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying... Um, basically the introduction there is that you they're having a go at him, that it's contention. They're having a little bit of a go at him because he shouldn't, in theory, he shouldn't have been mixing with other people as per some old laws and old standards. Verse 11, just jumping forward. And behold, immediately there was three men already come into the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied, accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house which stood and said unto him, Send me to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. I have one word in, in, my, uh, in my chapter here in my Bible, just one word colored in, and that's for two different reasons. Firstly, 
My wife tells me I'm really bad at colouring in, so I try to reduce how much I colour in. But I have highlighted the last word in verse 14. Because people will tell you that Acts chapter 10, the detailed version of the condensed version of Acts chapter 11, is just a story. And that it's not needed for today. And that, that that was something that just happened some time ago and it was a great experience for Peter and the household and for Cornelius. But my Bible links this moment in time and this experience that Peter had and with this household, Acts 11, last word in verse 14, it links it with being saved. And, and many people will want to contend with this and they'll want to be contentious and at the end of the day, it's up to people whether they want to choose whether it's just a story or could there be something in this where I will know that when I receive the Holy Spirit, my salvation is secured that I'm right with God. Like I'll actually know it. And it's not about church. It's not about religion. It's just a simple word in a wonderful story in an endless book. And it applies to us this day as much as it applied to them back then. I remember one of our young people in the audience here, Cartini. Um, Cartini got baptised here. And Mark Barnes and I went and saw her, I think, the next day or the following day after that, I'm not sure. It was later in the afternoon and we sat with you in your lounge room and we were going over some scriptures and there were scriptures like this um, we turned to 1 Corinthians 14 where it talks about speaking in tongues in verse 2 and verse 14 and it just, I don't think it was sinking in too much what was going on but then she got an Indonesian I think King James Version Indonesian or something like that and I, I was sitting across from you Kartini and Mark was to my right and it was probably the third time we'd gone over the same scripture and all of a sudden because it's sort of in language you understand I, I saw the light come on with Cartini and she just got it it all made sense to her and so we prayed for a couple of minutes we prayed for a couple of minutes we prayed a third time for a couple of minutes and all of a sudden the roof was lifted on a Monday or Tuesday, late afternoon in Old Ranella, the roof was lifted, the volume went up, and Cartini received the Holy Spirit. When we were trying to get away, to drive away later, I was trying to jump in my car, and I've got this woman yelling out, Hallelujah, praise the Lord! Because God had entered her life. And, and people can make this into some sort of argumentative thing or contention, but it's a Wednesday night, I'm up for keeping things simple. There is one word that I have coloured in here. And what happened to Cartini that day and what happened at the end of Acts chapter 10 here, it's, it's important and it's pivotal and it's exciting. And again, it's, it's not playing church. It's not doing religious arguments. It's a cool and an amazing, miraculous experience from God. Amen? Um, <clears throat> let's go to... Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, we'll just read a chunk as we... Um, <clears throat> head towards the end so the Israelites at this time were taken captive by the empire of Babylon um, a lot happened to the children of Israel and um, it never seemed to be too smooth but just in this part and there was a reason why they were taken captive but anyway um, let's just hit this story <clears throat> the hand of the Lord was upon me in verse 1 and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley which was full of bones. Um, the picture that goes into my mind is the, um, um, the uh, what is it, the, the elephant bones out of the Lion King, the elephant graveyard. So if you need something, a picture, I get 
my references from The Lion King. But, um, and caused me to pass by round, uh, them round about. And behold, there were very many in the, open, in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? So, by the way, God is talking to Ezekiel, the prophet. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O O Lord God, you know. I I love that massive handball back to the Lord. I wouldn't know which way to answer God either on this situation. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, which is sort of the peace between the, the bone and the muscle in a body. And will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you. And you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and I prophesied and there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to bone. And when I behold, lo, the sinews of the flesh came upon them and, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breath upon the the slain, that thou may live. So I prophesied as he commanded thee, and the breath came into them, and he lived and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, on my people I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And I shall place in you your own land, and th- um, in you your own land, then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, thus saith the Lord. It's an, it's an amazing story. It's a picture that Ezekiel was given by the Lord, this valley of dry bones. My contention with this story is that why were they, in, it's a miracle. Why were they not, they not taken from dry bones to a perfectly living f- human flesh like that? Why not? I, I wonder whether it's because um, um, things come in different times in life um, and there can be different stages for different things. And out of this story, I, my mind went to um, three different things. There's, uh, in life, I, I guess I just wanted to tap into here, especially when it says their hope was lost and just the different chapters that life can bring and the different patches that life can bring and sometimes people feel like they're just surviving they're not thriving but they're just surviving whatever's going on in their own life um, privately or publicly or publicly or whatever that they they're just getting through it and in this very story here where it goes in increments that there is hope that is given to bones that have that have been dried up and they've lost their hope and that they're not they're nowhere near thriving and that they can come to life and that when when God is involved you know the little bit about Mordecai talking to Esther and Esther may not have believed in herself but her uncle believed in her and sometimes when we're in a patch where we feel like we're just surviving which, which is okay, because life offers a whole lot of different chapters and a whole lot of different segments and parts. But if we're in that patch, then all we need to do is understand and believe that God believes in us. And, you know, when, um, when we were over in Papua New Guinea some years ago, I was just listening to, uh, I mean, the, the altar call with Pastor Godfrey, um, and he, he calls out to the people, the, the saved and unsaved, and he says, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And, and maybe over here that sounds really religious and churchy and whatever, but when, when we lack belief in ourselves and we feel like we're not thriving, but we should be 
and we're only just getting through, what a pivotal thing to remember that Jesus loves us. And like Mordecai believed in someone else and planted this seed of hope and belief, and she turned a nation to salvation. Then the hope and belief that we need to take that God believes in us is pivotal. And then the, the point that these people were lost in, in despair and stuff and that they were taken captive by the Empire of Babylon, that's because they were lost for a season, they were lost for a time in, in idolatry and, and rebellion. And that if we want to go on to the next stage from survival to success, then part of success is giving away the stuff that has, brought, that has pulled us back, that has dragged us down. And so in a different chapter in our life, and a different part in Ezekiel 37, where now the bones aren't just sh shaking and rattling, that they're coming to life and the sinews are building up, the body is being formed, that we move into a different chapter where we start thinking, what can we do with my life? What can I do with my life? What else can I do for the Lord? This, the, the prospects in front of me become exciting, no matter the age, no matter the background. And then sharing it, survival, success, and then just sharing it. In verse 10, it uses the word great army as these, as these bones are given life and, and then they're given breath and they come together. And the great army in verse 10, and it's worded, when we come together and we share stories, we heard about Noel Cavanagh who, who, on Sunday who wasn't just on his deathbed but had his funeral planned yet a whole story has turned around and the funeral has been cancelled and a woman, a, a nurse that had been praying and fasting for three days that looked after Noel um, is, now, um, is now talking to him about things of the Lord she was looking for an answer and, and Noel is part of a great army that believe in victories and, and miracles and he shared that and now another life is being turned around our, our belief, I should close up, I had one more thing, but our, our belief is, is just pivotal in this life. And um, at the very core, just like Mordecai believed in Esther, we need to always remember that the Lord believes in us no matter what's going on in our life. Amen.